Hey. Hello, y'all. Hell. Hello. Um, let me introduce myself. I'm Dr. Samaria Cobra. For those who don't know, I am the founder of an organization called Kingdom Creative Counseling, where I'm currently located. I'm a licensed therapist with over 16 years worth of experience. It'll be actually 20. Um, count down the days, y'all. I think August of next year, I got my first job. I was not doing therapy, but I got my first job. I want to say September either September of August of 2005. So yeah, a long time, right? <laughs> um, I'm also obsessed with writing a published author. I've written 92 books and I'm currently working on 93. I have uh, took a little sabbatical, took about two weeks uh, break from writing, but I'm back and I'm grateful to God. And um, what else? I have a podcast and and I do all kinds of things. And uh, the purpose is to fulfill my purpose, but also to teach, to train, to develop and to help people overcome um, a mindset. Now, of course, I give this disclaimer. This is not therapy. Um, <laughs> it's not therapy. So I do encourage you to go to therapy. It's just a really good space to be able to record my podcast as well in my, um, in my office. Um, and I'm I've said this disclaimer um, multiple times, but I think it's really important to um, kind of reiterate that um, I do not use um, personal, um, my clients' lives, personal lives, uh, or anything or what's going on in our world as a clapback um, to what's going on uh, in the world today, okay? I don't do that. And I said it because every now and again, people um, will take back, I don't really care, but I just thought to give you a disclaimer, they will... Uh, be offended at something that I said like just because I know you does not mean or I, you know of me does not mean I'm using your information or you know what I'm saying my, my clients don't do that they have people that I know know and they think that I am trying to use my social media platform even though it's a little small um, to clap back at people and I just don't do that okay but the shoe fits go ahead and wear it <laughs> okay um, and so I did give you examples from my own life um, but it is my, it was my prerogative to tell my testimony. It is not my prerogative to tell someone else's. So if you are offended, that's fine. Somebody, uh, DM me. I, I never check DMs. I don't do business be a DM. They were like saying something snarky. And I was just like, okay, well, God bless you. <laughs> All right. So that's that disclaimer. I'm not gonna keep doing that every, every session, but for the sake of our time today. So today we're going to talk about a topic called Mind Your Mindset. I was actually, uh, you know, God gives me um, different nuggets and um, and I was thinking about what I should talk about and I heard Mind Your Mindset in a still small voice. And so I want to talk to you about that. Anything that you want to do, anything that you want to be successful at, there is a mindset shift that has to happen. As a matter of fact, I think it may be the next, teaching coming up those ones on friday are pre-recorded um i think it, it's called as a man thinks in his heart so it's not gonna be the same as this one but it's still gonna kind of caveat from that but anything you want in life um you're gonna have to change your mind concerning certain things you kind of let go of certain mindsets do they want to talk about a mindset that prevents people from operating in their success as christians as believers as people who have a kingdom mandate in a world that is oppositional to Christ and to God. Um, there's a difference between a church mindset and the kingdom mindset. A kingdom mindset, the Bible says, go ye all into the world making disciples. And so when you have a kingdom mindset, you, you literally take that scripture literally. I want to be successful in every area of my life. My business needs to honor God. My, my life has to honor God. Everything I do as a kingdom citizen is so that I can make disciples in the world. Now, we have a church mindset. You just want to have more church and bring people to church and that's kind of it but but the kingdom of god must be manifest in what you do outside of church church prepares you and i hear people saying all the time uh the church is a hospital and i, I agree with that in some places be, in some spaces because people come to church who are mostly broken uh mental health i think that there's a time and a space for therapy uh but what happens when you're no longer um think about a hospital we don't all we don't spend every sunday at a hospital most of us I I think in my entire 43 years of living, I may have been to the hospital for emergency maybe three times. And the fourth time I was born in the hospital, obviously I was born at Johns Hopkins University in Baltimore, Maryland. So if the church is only a hospital, 
for broken people, then it's just a gathering place for broken people. But what happens when you're no longer broken? What happens when you don't have a crisis? What happens when you don't have an emergency? So when you have a kingdom mindset, you want to prepare people to be successful in every area of their life. I have, um, I want to be successful in business. I am successful in business, but I want business to grow. I'm successful in different areas of my life. And that's not to brag, but if I only had this kind of mindset where I'm just going to go wait for the rapture to come, or if I'm just only going, if I'm only, if I'm, if I only have a, um, a, 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 a certain mentality of brokenness, what happens when I'm no longer broken? And you do get to that place. There's a, a theology, I believe it's called liberation theology. Now you can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, where we see ourselves in light of our oppression. So all of our messages, everything that we do is meant to, is meant to encourage us. God's getting ready to bless us. It's going to be good. He's going to free us from our enemies and that's fine. But what, what happens when your mentality is no longer that of an oppressed person? You understand? You can be a person not having a mentality of that. So everything that you do and everything that you say, you have to change your mind shift so that you can see it before you see it, so you can actualize it. So we're going to talk about different mindsets to prevent people from um, moving forward. There's a scripture that talks about you cannot put old new wine in old wine skins. That means you cannot operate in a new with old mentality. Things do change. There's a reason why we don't. And I said this before, I think in a, a different teaching, I don't remember when because I've done so much. Uh, I said, there's a reason why we don't go to Blockbuster Video when we want to rent videos. Most of us, like me, you go to Netflix. We don't even go to Redbox no more. Uh, there's a reason why we don't, when we are out of town, I was recently out of town, I didn't catch a yellow cab. I didn't catch a yellow cab to get where I need to go. How many of us has caught in a yellow cab? Why? Because things change. Uh, when I was young, and I said this in, in one of those teachings, when I was young, if we needed to find somebody's phone number, we had a big old book called the Yellow Pages. Well, why don't we look up numbers in Yellow Pages? Why? Because things change. People change. Now, what we need not necessarily does not change. You're still going to need people's numbers. We're going to be watching movies till the end of days, probably. <laughs> um... Uh, we always we will we will always need transportation. People for the most part will always need books, but the largest transportation company does not actually own cars, and that is Uber. Why? Because of change and innovation. Um, someone else is going to say, um, things change, right? Things change, and we cannot take. There's a reason why when I was growing up, my my grandmother who was 91 years old, uh, 92, I think, uh, in her early this 20 years ago when she, before she passed away, she had a rotary phone. And her, when the last time you saw a rotary phone? Things change, and so we can be right on the cuff of the change and, and right on the cuff of what something new that God is getting ready to do and our mindset does not change. We're trying to, we're trying to do things that are not or try to take people into our new that God has not ordained. We have to mind our mindset because it is not the people that come against us for the most part. It is our mindset that's going to prevent us. I begin to ask God because I'm observing things that are not God's will. And uh, I just begin to pray because I try not to make judgments on when I see things I know not as God. So I just got God, God is in me. Am I seeing this off? Like what's going on? I never forget uh, recently, and I wrote this in my book, um, Prophesy in a Hard Place as well. I said, God, what in the world? What's, 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 what, what, what is, what is this? They, they, you know, they, you know, cause people lie. They do. They, 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 they lie. Make it seem like things are wonderful and this is growing and this, and then they, they lie. I said, God, these people are falling asleep. They're distracted. Christians distracted. And you know what God said to me? He said, my people perish for lack of knowledge. Not because we can't shout church people. Not because we don't have a buck and a shout in us. Prophetic word. Not because we can't run, jump, hoop, holler, and squalor. Did you know most Christians don't even study their Bible nowadays? So they perish for a lack of knowledge. We have to mind our mindset. Um, and I talked to you about God. I, I, he's my best friend. I love Jesus. And um, I began to talk to him about some personal things and I said, God, I'm not satisfied here. And 
Uh, and I'm again, I'm not gonna tell you personally, I was like, well, you know, I, this is not fulfilling to me. And he said, Samaria, because you are, you excel in a learning environment. You are, you, uh, you want to grow. And so I know how to stand up and be the professor and the teacher and teach you how to do things, but there's a part of my mind that has to grow, that has to be receiving information. And I'm not just talking about any information, I'm talking about information from God. I can't be in a place where we pretend to not be stuck, we, we we run we move forward, we're really stuck and stagnant. I do not excel well in places where I do not have, I don't grow. I just, it just, I just, that's why I'm constantly reading, taking a class, you know, buying books. <laughs> So, um, so we gotta have a we gotta mind our minds because we want to walk in the things of God. We do want to walk in what God has us, and uh, you can live your life and do like Dr. Miles Monroe said, and die uh, with potential. That means you die and you never walk into the potential because you never changed your mind. All right, that's my introduction. <laughs> We're going to get through this, y'all. Um, so Philippians 2, 5. I'm going to start by reading this from the New King James Version. And it reads, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. So when I talk about the mind, so when I begin to seek God, when I'm, when I'm in communion with him, when I meditate on his word, when I have a love for his word, my actions, my thoughts, my ideas of what I desire are in line with scripture. It's a reflection upon scripture. This is what the Bible says. Um, if I delight myself in the Lord, he will give me the desires of my heart. Does not mean if I delight myself in the Lord, he's going to give me what I want. He means he's going to change my thoughts, my patterns, my, my habits, my proclivities, my weaknesses to be in line with his will. So therefore his desire and my desire are in one. Let's talk about mindsets that stop us from moving into our success place. You ever say, God, I don't understand why we're not moving forward. Today. I'm about fit to tell you why. Well, I'm getting ready to tell you why. <laughs> That's a North Carolina thing. I'm fitting. I'm getting ready to tell you why. Uh, one is pride. Now, I've done a lot of um, uh, the longer videos on this. So I'm going to go hit it with this one. I'm not going to talk about it, but pride comes before destruction. Um, there's so many negative things when someone is lifted up in pride. And let's be clear. You can have someone that presents very nice. They're kind of, oh, that's, that's sweet. Oh, yes, ma'am. No, man. Yes, doctor. And they are full of pride. You can know by their actions. Uh, disobedient. They don't follow the instructions of God. They um, disregard uh, other people's thoughts, feelings. There's so many things that come along with pride, you know, the, the need to be worshiped. Genesis chapter 11, they said the people of God gathered together and said, we're going to build us a tower to heaven. And the reason why New Living Translation, the King James Version, so they wanted to make a name for themselves. Then I also said, not only do they want to make a name for this, they want to make themselves famous. But see, that's pride. You want to build something, but you want to build it because of pride. You want to put your name on something because of pride. And so God said, I oppose the proud. And so when God opposes the proud, what you're trying to do, he just, he just closes his hand and says, no, he, he, he becomes an opposition to what you are trying to do. And we're trying to force God's hand because God opposes the proud. So you're not going to walk into your kingdom success. I don't care how, uh, how much we move a crowd, you never move God when you are lifted up in pride, when you, when you're full of pride, you don't humble yourself. Let's keep that moving. Again, I did do a whole teaching on that. If you're watching this via my YouTube channel or via my podcast, just look up pride, Dr. Samaria Cobra, a whole bunch of stuff will pull up. Entitlement. I have a great disdain for entitled people because I've been uh, in the past, not now, in relationships with people who are very entitled. Uh, now I'm not talking about me like I'm bigger or better than anybody, but I have someone who's worked you understand what I'm saying? Most of my life, I've had two and three jobs. And I can't stand, the reason why I have a great disdain for people who are entitled is because they see you working hard. Eventually, you work hard, you're still broke. <laughs> but you keep working hard, you're going to run to a, a pathway of success. You're going to have that business. You're going to have the car. You're going to have the dream life because consistency and persistency, watch this, will always pay off. But you got someone that's entitled. They think their hard work, they're entitled to the benefits of your hard work. Uh, these are the people that don't want to work. These are the people that think because we're family that we ought to be, uh, I ought to take care of you grown and you, uh, you, you got two able bodies. Okay. Uh, but you want people to take care of you because we are entitled to other people's success. And I have seen people become pure evil because they are entitled. Now we're just reading scripture recently. I'm not going to go there. Luke chapter. No, I'm not going to, I'm not going to tell you the scripture. <laughs> just go look it up on your own time. Let me just free somebody here today because I know in culture we talk about my family, this and family, that the only two people that you are required to take care of, according to scripture, is orphans 
and widows. As a matter of fact, the, the Bible verse in James says widows and orphans, but also says widows over the age of 60. So, uh, you know, unfortunately, if you are, you say I'm an orphan, but you're 35. Now we certainly have, um, uh, some empathy but towards you, right? And so you can go to therapy to process through the the, the 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 struggles that you had as an orphan, but you are still over the age of 18. You're 35 years old. You're well by and able. We are not obligated to take care of you. Okay, so that's, you know, I mean, I know that sounds harsh, but we got to clarify that. The other thing is, again, widows. Um, uh, we are obligated. The Bible talks about justice for widows. It talks about to take care of them. It talks to, to honor them. And so... Um, the most vulnerable population, Luke chapter 18, it kind of gives us some, some, um, uh, some, some clarity towards that. God blesses those. So I want to uh, free you. The reason why I bring, bring that up is I want to free you from this entitled mindset when you have family members of people, oh, we, we, we brought, we were brought up together. You, well, you got it. I got it. Now you think you better. No, no, no. I'm only obligated to take care of two people, two, not two different, but, but categories of people. Y'all know what I mean? Orphans who are children and widows over the age of 60. That's it. So free yourself, my, uh, my, 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 uh, when we talk about this dysfunctional family roles, free, your, free yourself, givers, from thinking that you are obligated to, have, to give loyalty to people who are grown well by the neighbor because we're family. Free yourself from that. Okay. The victim mentality. <laughs> so that's an entitled mentality. I could go on and on, on child, because I've come across some entitled people. And I mean, just as lazy. Don't want to do nothing. Can't keep a job. And think, because some married success, you lost your ever loving. Oh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> sorry, y'all. I mean, <laughs> we'll bring it, Musa, bring it down. Bring it down. Bring it down. Okay. The victim mentality. Uh, you can't really do anything with the victim mentality because in any situation, they're going to always see themselves as the victim. It's never their fault. People just come against them. You know, I, I gave an example of someone I was working with many, many years ago. And, and you know, you try, you feel I have empathy towards someone. Oh, this person did that to me. That person did that to me. And at first it's like, yeah, you know, no weapon formed against you. So you're trying to encourage them because you don't know, you don't know the whole story. But let me tell you what I learned, brothers and sisters. Listen, get that whole story, okay? Well, but so every time it was always you fighting somebody else, and someone else did you wrong, and this person did you wrong, and I think, and it's and one day it just it, I don't, I don't know if it was the Lord or it was just me. Something hit me like, wait a minute, now. wait a minute, wait a minute, now. so wait a minute, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. you the common denominator in every situation. Now let's be honest here. If you go from one bad relationship to one, everybody's trying to use it, but you the common denominator. These people did me wrong, but you're the common denominator. See, fool me once. Shame on me. But you keep fooling me over and over and over again. Come on now. You can't be the victim in every situation. Uh, learned helplessness. Um, that's also a form of uh, of um Depression, believe it or not, when a person is so depressed and so down, they feel helpless to get themselves out of their situation. So we certainly do give empathy and uh, and compassion to people who experience clinical depression. Uh, it is a sign uh, of depression, but also there are some people who are really not are depressed, but they still don't think that they are empowered to do anything about their situation. I remember some years ago, I was working with someone else um, years ago and uh, no matter what I did, no matter what I said, it was, oh, it's not going to work. Yeah, I tried that. No, and I was like, why Why are you here? And so <laughs> here's the thing. Why do I always talk about problems? This is a side note. Why do I talk about problems a lot? Because people don't really, <laughs> because I'm a, I'm a therapist, but in, in nat my natural inclination is the spirit of wisdom, but I'm a problem solver. Okay. And, um, and I tr try to hear from God, um, concerning that, but anyway, people really don't come to therapy because they just want to talk. They really come because there is a problem. Otherwise they wouldn't come talk to a therapist. You may come talk to a coach or someone. So there's more of a problem there than, uh, than anything. And so your purpose of destiny actually uh, answers a, answers a problem. Um, so anyway, that's neither here nor there, but, um, but so the, no, 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 I, I can't, I just like, if, if, <laughs> 
you want help, but you don't want to, you know, but there's, there's, you have to have a mindset that um, where there's a will, there's a way, where there's a no, there's a yes, where there's a closed door, there's an open door. But if you think life is just supposed to show up at your door and help you learn helplessness. As a poverty mentality, there's a lot to go with it. I actually did a whole teaching. I think I did two parts, believe it or not, maybe two or three years ago on a poverty mentality. The poverty mentality has nothing to do with what you're in the, your bank account. It's a mindset. You could have someone that has a bank account that's in the negative, right? But your mindset says, I'm going to get myself out of this situation. And you start working with Holy Spirit and connecting yourself with right people um, and start doing certain things that take you out of that, um, that will take you out of your situation. You recognize the situation I find myself in. It is temporary and it is, um, and it is, it's temporary. I'm going to come out of it. And you can have a mindset of, you know, how am I going to, and you start working towards and you got God downloads to you ideas and he starts telling you certain things. And so poverty mindset is not your physical uh, location. You could be living in poverty, but a mindset says, I'm not going to be here long. This is a temporary circumstance. And again, there's a lot that goes with someone who has a poverty mindset that's entitled. They're always trying to get something for nothing. So um, again, that's a really, really good teaching um, uh, on the poverty mindset. And just, just Google YouTube poverty mindset will pull up. It'll kind of give you some context. But the ones I did as well, I think I could add a little something too. Because you ever dealt with somebody who has a poverty mindset and you have a go-getter mindset? It's just... All right, y'all. Religious mindset. These are people who um, love church more than they love God. Um, these are things we're doing things absent from the presence or the power of God. Uh, I was listening to Bishop R.C. Blakes and he said this. He said, if the rapture would have come today, you know, the church would still show up on Sunday the next day. These are people who go through the actions of worship, but their hearts are not really for God. OK, uh, and there's so many um, different uh, symptoms of that. I feel like some of the, the 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 tips or the symptoms that I've given you about a mindset is a heavy. The, the, these are heavy topics. I'm just kind of hitting and kind of moving on because that's not the gist of. But a religious mindset um, will move forward in something that is not God, but claim it is God. A religious mindset is focused on titles and positions and prominence but not really seeking his will concerning a matter. Remember your titles and your positions don't anoint you. And so there's so much I can say about the religious mindset. A religious mindset is not only stuck on rules and regulations. A religious mindset does not consider the will of God concerning a matter before we move forward. It's just, this is what we do. This is what we've always done. A religious mindset is not open to change. Okay. Then we got called the negative nilla. These are the people that the glass is half empty. They're easily offended and they struggle with the root of re uh, rejection. Okay. So no matter what you do, they're going to see things in negative light. They're pessimistic and they call it, they call it, they call it discernment, but they're really critical of everybody and they're pessimistic. Then we got the fruit of root of rejection. You see everything from the eyes of people rejecting you, even if they're not rejecting you. You can be so afraid of rejection that you don't move forward in rejection. Again, I've done lots of teachings upon that. Prejudice or bias mindset. That is a preconceived opinion not based upon actual experience. So prejudice or bias is not just racism. It just means we form opinion without experience. We are prejudiced towards something or bias. We so favor uh, in one thing or in one person compared to the another, but it's generally unfair. I have a bias to it. Anything can be biased. Anything can, you can have a bias stats, statistics and bias. You can have bias research. You can have bias and a proclivity with a certain thing and you see in a certain light because that's what your thing is. So prejudice and bias is not always uh, racism. Sometimes it's just your mentality. Okay. So uh, how do we know Proverbs 18, 4 through, I'm sorry, 18, 12 through 14. You can read this on your own. So I'm actually running out of time, y'all. It says um, Proverbs 18, 12 through 14, King James Version 13 verses, he who answers a matter before he hears it is folly and shame unto him. The New Living Translation reads, um, um, Spouting off before listening to the facts is both shameful and foolish. 
So we don't come to conclusions concerning a matter until we get the full facts. It would be nice if you actually had the facts. And sometimes people don't want to give you a conversation to be able to put things together, but try your best not to make opinions about other things before you want to hear from God and to have a conversation with someone, okay? Um, delusional thinking, you think that you are something you are clearly not. We are living in an alternative reality that just not make good sense. You know, calling right, wrong, and wrong, right. It's just that we are living in a delusional society. Like, I was listening to someone. They were being very judgmental towards someone else. But I know their story. And I was like, how you, how you talking bad about someone else? But you, I don't get it. We are living in an alternative reality. Uh, and I could go, there's actually a disorder called delusional disorder. I've actually, I have, it's not something people diagnose easily, but it, it gets really weird. Like, you know, someone thinks they're an FBI agent and they're like, you work at 7-Eleven, you know, stuff like that. Like, uh, people are tracking, it, it gets really weird or they, it just get there is a form of delusional disorder. And just because you're delusional doesn't mean you have that disorder, but it gets really weird. I, you know, you, you work at Walmart, but you think you're the president of the United, like that, it, that's how that delusional disorder gets but now you have people who have, it, it, ooh, I'm, I'm, I'm watching my words, <laughs> are straight delusional. Okay, that means to believe a lion tongue, a lion demon, uh, a lustful or covetous or griefful spirit. Um, you can't have a mindset of fulfilling your kingdom purpose when you were motivated by greed, covetousness. And lust, and there's so many scriptures that will justify that. You can be lustful for people, persons, and positions, but you'll never walk into your kingdom assignment. Okay, and one of the ways you you know that someone is lustful, believe it or not, uh, is uh, is when they want to argue. James four one through three says, "What causes quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from evil desires that war within you?" Verse two. So what do you do? You scheme and you scam and you assault people's character or assault their what's the word their you try to um paint their name because you are lustful for their position okay let's talk a little more here we're almost done a liar or someone who's constantly lying uh, John 8, 43 through 45 says for you are the children of the devil and you love to do things uh, for you are the children. Oh, let me. Do it. For you are children of the father. Wait a minute. For you are the children of your father, the devil, and you love to do evil things. It talks about the devil being the father of all lies. Mind your mindset. Disobedient. You cannot. You cannot disobey your way into God's promises. You can shout. You can hoop. You can holler. You can swallow. You can fast for a hundred minutes. If God told you to go left. You can't go right, left, right, left. If God told you to go to Green Street, but you go to Elm Street and Market Street, then Summit Avenue, but God told you to go. You'd be surprised. Anyway, a hard-hearted or stubborn heart, um, which is a form of idolatry. When someone is stubborn, according to Proverbs 12, 15, they don't take advice from wise counselors, or they take advice from uh, people who don't know what they're talking about, okay? When you're hard-hearted, when you're stubborn, this is my way or the highway, and your way is not working. You know, we do that in therapy. How's that working for you? And people say, this is it. How's that working for you? If it's not working, okay? <laughs> Transgressor, that means to someone who is, there are people who are like that, who just constantly break rules, spiritual rules and natural rules. It means a criminal, an offender. The Bible says the way of a transgressor is hard. You will not walk into your kingdom without being a transgressor. Okay. Uh, that's Proverbs 13, 15. Verse 16, the lottery mentality. You know, if I just be good, if I just shout, you know, <laughs> God gonna give it to me. You know, we, you know, no, it's no, no. Okay, give me a few more minutes, y'all. Uh, a divine neighbor. If you ever look up dysfunctional family roles, you will find there was one person that has helped to support and foster unhealthy relationship behaviors and patterns. This is called a divine enabler. 
Now, there's a difference between helping someone and enabling them to stay stuck. We call it helping, but if 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 you're if you're pouring into something and it's and it's not taking root and it's growing, that means you're a divine enabler. You're not a helper. Okay. Um, a lazy or immature people. Lazy people don't. Lazy people. <laughs> <laughs> it's similar to entitled people. They want the benefits of hard work without doing anything. Immature people cannot walk through your kingdom assignment. See, the word of God matures you. That's why you have Christians who've been saved 10, 15 years because they don't mature past certain things because they don't spend time in God's work. But you cannot walk into your kingdom assignment uh, with maturity when you're immature. When you're faithful over a few things, God changes your mindset and prepares you for the next thing. So what is the mindset that we should have? And that is the mindset, watch this, that takes action steps to produce. Uh, to produce. And that's, you can't have a lottery mindset, just think I just shout. But no, 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 you have to have a mindset. You have to have a strategy from God. Okay? So that means three mindsets. I got to grow. I got to mature. And I have to operate in success that only comes from a different mindset that comes from watching action steps step that I must continue to do repetitively over time that will get me to the desired result. My action steps will always lead me, watch this, to have opposition because God, the enemy, and I said this many times, anytime I can fall asleep while you fulfill your kingdom assignment, particularly if you're really being used by God. So I have to have these action steps or strategy, watch this, despite opposition. Let's read this. Um, and I'm going to paraphrase it because I'm running out of time here. Uh, Mark 4, 3 through 9, talks about how Jesus did a parable. So a parable are stories that Jesus used to illustrate how the kingdom of God operates. And he talks about how this, he said, there was a farmer who went out and planted seed on the ground. He said, uh, some seed on some seeds fell on the footpath and the birds came and ate it up. Other seeds fell on a rock and it sprouted, but it was, it was shallow. So it didn't take root. Other seeds grew, uh, fell near thorns and it grew, but it was choked up in a tender plants and the tender plants produced nothing. And other seeds fell on fertile ground and they produced some 30, some 60, some 100 fold as much as it had been planted. And he says, if anyone hears, they should listen and understand. So people, the, the disciples were like, okay, what that means? <laughs> so this is what Jesus says. And Jesus said to them, if you can't understand the meaning of this parable, how will you understand all other parables? The plant, the farmer plants seed by taking God's word to others. The seed that fell on the footpath represents those who hear the message, watch this, and Satan comes quickly to take it away. There's another translation that reads immediately to come take it away. So you can get a good, good word from God and we shout and we're happy, but Satan immediately snatches that a word away. Okay. Okay. Then the seed that fell on rocky soil are those who hear the message. They receive with joy. So we shout hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. But they don't have deep roots, so it don't last long. And you can't fill your kingdom assignment when you get easily discouraged. So they don't have deep roots, it don't last long. They fell as soon as they experienced problems and persecution for believing God's word. So the seed that fell amongst the thorns represent those who hear the word of God, but watch this, but all too quickly, the message is crowded with the worries of life. And the lures of wealth and the desire for other things. God wants to be wealthy. And that's fine. But wealth cannot be our God. And the pursuit of material things cannot be our God. And so we get worried. How am I going to? And it snatches the word away. But watch this. But the seed that fell on good soil produced those who accept God's word. And they produce some 30 some 60 and some 100 fold as much as it had been planted. So when the word of God and, the, and you endure the thing that you have to endure, you're going to produce a harvest and you will find success in every area of your life, in your ministry, in your marriage, in your business, you will produce something. It's going to produce a harvest. Some will produce 30 some people, I've heard people say it's a, it's a progression. It starts 30%, then 60%, then it's 100%. Um, so it, it just depends on how you interpret the text. 
but I'm going to produce. Imagine getting a thirty percent increase on in everything you planted or every every investment. Imagine getting a sixty percent uh, uh, result or a sixty percent uh, increase on everything that you did your investments. But imagine a hundred. You know, you 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 sell one hundred dollars, you get a thousand dollars. Imagine that. So we have to, when we talk about a success mindset, hear from God, learn of his ways, ask what is his will, and then keep doing that. You're going to keep being consistent and you're going to run into a path called success. You're like, how do you do that? Because why they were somewhere tripping and slipping and dipping and being distracted, you were somewhere working, doing what God told you to do. Whatever you want in life, remember this, whatever you want in life, Starts by changing your mind, changing your mind and making action steps towards it. But I can't just figure it out on my own. If God gives you a vision, you just know how exactly how. No, changing your mind and say, God, what is the way that you want me to take? Change your mind. If I get to a stuck place, is it my mindset that's keeping me stuck? All right, I'm Dr. Samaria Cobert. I'm the founder. I'm the... <laughs> If you want to check me out, request speaking engagement. All my books are www.drsamaricoper.com. I got some training resources as well at the same website, but you can go to trainingchristianleaders.com or if you're requesting um, uh, um, therapy, you have to be in North Carolina or can get to the thing in North Carolina. That's www.kingdomcreativecounseling.com. Be unstoppable. Be unstoppable, y'all. And if you can't get anywhere near me, uh, go to www.psychologytoday.com and they will be glad to assist you in finding a local therapist in your local area, Okay. Uh, make sure you like and make sure you subscribe. Bye, y'all. Bye.